Hello, my name is Rick Brown, consultant orthopaedic surgeon specialising in foot and ankle surgery at the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre, Oxford. This lecture is on the subject of orthotics and it's a vital topic because it's the mainstay and starting point of most of our orthopaedic treatment plans for patients with foot and ankle problems. We all work closely with a team of uh, ortho orthotists, podiatrists and physiotherapists. It's important we share an understanding of the principles behind their work. In this lecture, we'll discuss the definitions in orthotics. We'll talk about the principles of orthotic management and the mechanisms by which they work. We'll discuss the types and different functions of orthoses, as well as getting a clear understanding of the terminology. Finally, we'll discuss the common orthotics used in foot and ankle surgery and their clinical indications. It's important to have a clear understanding of the difference between a prosthesis and an orthosis. A prosthetic may be within the body and therefore called an endoprosthesis, which is more commonly thought about as a joint replacement, or it can be an artificial body part on the outside, such as a um, below knee prosthesis, and these more strictly speaking could be described ectoprosthesis on the outside of the body. There's a long history of use of prosthetics and indeed this picture illustrates one of the earliest prosthesis which was a prosthetic hallux found with a mummy in an Egyptian tomb. A wide range of technologies are used to make prosthetic limbs as illustrated by the more simple above knee prosthesis illustrated in the picture of a patient in Africa. These can involve an external brace or they can involve an orthotic device within the shoe. I think that you get the idea. All these separate methods and principles aim to improve the function of the patient. What type of orthosis is needed depends upon what you wish to achieve and also to a great extent what you have to work with. For an unstable joint, you need an orthotic that will support. For a painful joint or fracture, you wish to immobilize the limb. For, and to reiterate, for a flexible deformity, we can try to correct the deformity. But for a stiff deformity, this can only be accommodated. Let us remind ourselves of some simple biomechanics. The normal body is a balanced system. It is kept in uh, the correct position by a balance of internal forces with external moments. These are maintained in position by passive structures, capsules and ligaments and cartilage, and also by active movement and strength and forces developed by muscles. Therefore, if there is an imbalance in any of these structures, this will lead to a deformity leading to a loss of function. An orthotic attempts to rebalance this system. What is key to understand is that the orthotic can only achieve this and work through the soft tissues if the soft tissues are adequate and flexible. Orthotics can have this by a direct or by an indirect effect. If they're acting directly, they control rotational movements, they can control translational forces or movements, they can also share ax axial forces, whereas when working in an indirect method, an orthotic controls the line and action of the ground. So in this diagram, much more familiar to a foot and ankle surgeon, there's an unstable joint, the first MTP joint, and a bunion is causing difficulties due to a failure of the rotational moment around the joint. Using the same model as before, we can see how an orthotic will apply three-point fixation in a rigid manner and help to prevent the deformity. So I will reapply the same arrows and forces as seen in the schematic diagram from before. Indeed, if we um, think about the plastic hallux splint, it is simply working as a three-point fixation, fixation orthotic. Let's look at another model using the same schematic model, this time the upper bone is the tibia and the lower bone is uh, the talus. And 
with an ankle foot orthosis or a brace around the ankle, you can see how the same forces are being corrected again by three-point fixation. Sometimes there is more than just a rotational force around a damaged joint. There may be an element of translation, which is more commonly thought about, for example, at the knee. And to control the translational instability, you need an extra fourth point of fixation, as demonstrated in the diagram. An orthotic can be very effective at sharing the load or sharing the body weight. For example, it works as an exoskeleton, and a common example of this would be by a crow walker, as seen in the picture, for taking the weight off a painful, stiff hind foot, for example, after a Charcot neuroarthropathy. So that leaves the indirect method of uh, an orthotic. This acts by modifying the ground reaction force. In this picture, which is the lower limb, you can see the ground reaction force is passing very much to the medial side of the knee joint, compressing the medial compartment. And by placing a small triangular orthotic in the shoe, you can see how this uh, read aligns the ground reaction force closer to the axis and thereby opening up the medial joint, taking the pressure off the painful area. Here, the extended surface area medially moves the ground reaction force medially and prevents the overloading on the outside of the hind foot. When deciding which orthotic to use, the same principles as stressed throughout the course are considered. A thorough clinical assessment in a structured manner, looking at the patient standing, walking and sitting, and looking at feeling and moving the important areas of the foot. Obviously, the alignment of the lower limb and the hind foot are key, and watching the patient walk, as well as detecting any asymmetric shoe wear. An assessment of whether the deformity is static or dynamic, whether the muscles are spastic or is there a contracture, and to fully assess the, both the passive and active range of any joints and associated power of tendons moving across the joints. All these are key in your assessment. Here we can see an asymmetric heel strike and the consequential asymmetric outer wear in the lateral aspect of the heel. An assessment of the weight bearing through the sole of the foot can be made by a footprint study. This is uh, easily and cheaply performed by placing ink on the patient's foot and asking them to stand on a piece of paper. You can see in the centre area the bean shape of a normal plantar pressure, whereas on the left side there is increased medial pressure from overpronation from the falling of the medial arch, whereas on the outside there is minimal medial pressure because of extra supination and a very high arch. This can be measured in a more high-tech method using a pedobarograph, and you can localize the precise areas which are being overloaded, thereby giving you clear instructions as to how to design an orthotic to reduce the peak pressures. So let's uh, consider the full range of orthotics used in the foot and ankle. As we said, foot orthoses or FOs can be simple insoles, they can be total contact inserts, or they can be a more functional foot orthosis. Shoes can have external modifications to the heel or external modifications to the sole. And of course, splints can be applied either the traditional caliper design or a more plastic lightweight air foam. Simple off-the-shelf uh, lightweight insoles can provide some support and relieve some pressure. However, because of their, their softness, they can provide very minimal biomechanical support and therefore can only be used for fairly mild deformities. A stronger semi-rigid orthotic can be adjusted, for example, by having a metatarsal bar, which allows the weight to be moved around and offloaded from areas of pathology, such as in the case of Morton's neuroma or Freiburg's. This uh, picture illustrates a severe hammer-toe deformity, 
which has subluxed at the MTP joint, causing the fat pad to be pulled away from underneath the metatarsal head, exposing the metatarsal head, which has become overloaded and painful. This area can be protected by a design of an orthotic where there is an offload or a sink cut out underneath the painful area. Thereby, the distribution of forefoot weight is more even and more comfortable. This next diagram in the coronal plane also shows offloading, and in the bottom right it will appear the insole, which shows the softer material in the area of second metatarsalgia. In this case, the patient has a rather large and deep ischemic ulcer. The body weight needs to be shared more evenly across the entire surface area of the foot, and therefore a customised total contact insert is required. The foot is placed in a mould, and then the template is made, often from plaster of Paris, and then a plastic matching insole is produced. Having produced an insole which matches the contour and shape of the foot, it may at times be necessary to change the alignment of the foot, and this can be achieved by posting. Posting is an additional build-up underneath the insole to achieve a biomechanical effect. These can be, as shown in the diagram in the coronal plane, triangular wedges, both in the hind foot or the forefoot. Indeed, they can even be, in the sagittal plane, a triangular wedge to compensate for an Aquinas deformity. Here we return to the key point from earlier, where a fixed deformity can be accommodated by a tilting of the sole using a post, whereas a corrective posting will be useful for a flexible deformity. So for a flexible hindfoot valgus deformity, then a medial hindfoot post can help correction. Whereas for a flexible hindfoot varus deformity, then a lateral post can help correction. Here we can see the process involved in producing a customized orthotic, and um, it would strongly be recommended to take the opportunity to visit a good uh, orthotic center at some point in your training. So let's work through a few clinical examples. A common example of a planus foot. The problems are tight gastrocnemius, hind foot valgus instability, and perhaps pain in the sinus tarsi, and a flattened arch, which is therefore unable to lock the midfoot. This will lead to metatarsalgia, and all of these can be compensated on by use of an orthotic. For example, the remedy involves a heel lift with uh, stretching, which the patient can do for themselves, and a deep heel cup with perhaps a medial hind foot heel post. The arch can be addressed by a uh, support if required, and if there's a twisting forefoot pathology, then indeed there may even be a forefoot posting. Even further, support can be achieved by adding a uh, brace to extend this into working as an AFO. Another common and difficult situation is the cavus foot, in which there may be a tight gastrocnemius as well as hind foot varus. The high arch can also lead to increased foot pressures and there's often clawing of the toes. The remedy for these would be again perhaps a heel lift and asking the patient to perform calf stretches with a wide heel cup but this time the lateral heel posting would be on the other side. They also may need some support underneath the heightened arch and certainly with clawed lesser toes the toe box will need to be increased in size. It's important uh, we all have a good understanding and fluency in the terminology describing the different areas of a shoe. For example, the tongue, the upper, the outer sole, the midsole, and the counter. Often patients will have to have specially designed surgical composite of shoes, but it's always more important to think 
it's much easier to make the shoe fit the foot than to make the foot fit the shoe. Now we've discussed the insole, and we've discussed the shoe itself. So we can discuss what can be put on the outside of the shoe. Obviously, for a leg length inequality, you can add an extra area of height onto the shoe. But if a patient has a stiff ankle or midfoot or forefoot, they can consequently have a stiff first, second or third rocker. The rocker can be replaced by putting a rocker sole. Uh, as in this example, you can see the rocker is uh, towards the midfoot. And uh, in the summer, a popular choice are fit flops or MBT sandals, all of which provide a little forefoot rocker to alleviate uh, forefoot discomfort. Also, as touched on before, on the outside of a sole, you can add extra wedges and flares to alter the ground reaction force. And here you can see an example of a, a lateral flare. However, depending on your culture and your weather conditions, you may have the most extreme deformities, as in this patient, but uh, it may just be suitable to manage the patient with accommodative sandals. So the final type of orthotics in foot and ankle surgery, which I'd like to discuss, are splints. These can be calipers or now more frequently plastic ankle foot orthoses. These help patients who are having difficulties in stance phase and they can adjust the ground reaction force. Here in this diagram, you can see the toe is striking the ground and by applying the green AFO to bring the foot up into a dorsiflex position, the ground reaction force is brought backwards into alignment underneath the knee and hip. These calipers can be made in a traditional method with metal bars and straps. Uh, or they can be made by more lightweight designs. Patients are more compliant if the footwear is acceptable and this lightweight caliper design fits around a normal sports shoe. Often patients will be provided with a thermoplastic airfo which has been molded and contoured to the shape of their calf. This can have some elasticity and give some spring assistance. Again, the theory is the same at the, as the action is to change the line of action of the ground reaction force. So I hope you've enjoyed the journey through orthotics and I hopefully are now more aware of how these devices work are familiar with the terminology and are a better place to work with your local orthotist and podiatrist to prescribe the correct treatments. Good orthotic management can definitely reduce the need for surgery, but as for surgical practice, a good clinical examination is key to successful orthotic management. Thank you.